I was given the tough task to debate uh, this year's CSRS program co-chair and, and Dr. Cho, and uh, he just gave a very reasonable argument on kind of why to maybe watch and wait on these people. But I'm going to make an argument that if this were my neck um, at my age uh, and I had symptoms of myelopathy, I would actually want, want to have surgery. So these are my disclosures, uh, none of which are relevant to the contents of this talk. So this is just a case example, right? This is a 57-year-old healthy and active male um, with symptoms of mild DCM with an MJOA of 15, pretty significant cord compression uh, on MRI. And I think the I think the important things to consider, uh, particularly for something like this debate on whether or not we operate on this patient with mild DCM, is you know what are the chances that this is going to get worse? If this is my neck and I have mild symptoms and this is my MRI, I'm gonna ask the doc, well, you know, what's gonna happen if I just wait? Uh, what's the detriment or harm in waiting? What's the benefit of surgery? You know, do age, comorbidities, and the level of function play a factor? And, and again, like Sam said, you know, what would you do if this were you? So in the spirit of a good debate, I, I felt compelled to include a slide like this. I wasn't sure if Sam was going to come out with the gloves off swinging uh, or not. And these are always kind of more fun in, in, in person. But, um, but Sam, you know, my very esteemed colleague and friend kind of took the approach of saying, well, there's nothing really to worry about. Trust me. Uh, you know, we can watch, watch and wait on this. And, you know, give me a call if and when things get worse. And, and I'm going to take the approach of saying, if you really kind of look at the risks and benefits of non-operative care versus surgery in patients with mild DCM, I think surgery is a very reasonable option. And again, what would you want done if this were you? So I think some of the important things to really consider, you know, in this debate is, you know, what's the natural history, particularly what is the risk of progression? What's the risk of acute spinal cord injury? And then again, we, what are the risks and benefits of surgery. So let's start with the natural history of myelopathy and risk of progression. And Sam, Sam did a nice job of covering some of this. So the prevalence of asymptomatic spinal cord compression is relatively high, right? It's about 25%. And I would be the first to say, if you have no symptoms of, of myelopathy and you have spinal cord compression, absolutely. There's absolutely no reason to put that person through surgery. And you basically have a good discussion with them and you observe them. I think once you start developing signs of myelopathy, that changes, that changes everything. You know, the historical perspective from a natural history standpoint, and, and Sam alluded to this, 75% of people have long periods of stable neurologic function, about 20% of progressive stepwise decline, and about 5% have rapid decline of symptoms. I think we would all agree that the risk of an acute spinal cord injury uh, with patients with either asymptomatic spinal cord compression or even symptomatic spinal cord compression is, is, is pretty low. So I don't think we do surgery to prophylactically uh, prevent, you know, spinal cord injuries. And again, if, if patients are asymptomatic, Absolutely. It's okay to educate the patients, observe them with close clinical follow-up. So the analogy I kind of like to use, and I, I forget which one of my mentors taught me this, but in terms of differentiating asymptomatic spinal cord compression and myelopathy, it's like you're standing on a, a train platform waiting for the train. As long as you don't have symptoms, you could stand on that platform as long as you want, and you're, you're, you're totally fine. You're really kind of not in harm's way. But as soon as you kind of step on that train, and as soon as you start having symptoms of myelopathy, I think, I think everything changes. You know, the pathobiological processes of DCM have started, and this includes ischemia, neuroinflammation, and apoptosis. And I would kind of make the argument that there's really no way of getting off that train without surgery. Does not mean you have to rush into surgery for all these patients with mild DCM, but I think it's something to consider and to talk to your patients about. So what are, the, what are the risks of progression? We'll just go through a few studies here. This is a prospective study of 199 patients with spinal cord compression without clinical signs of myelopathy with a minimum two-year follow-up. And signs of DCM developed in 45 of these patients. So 22.6% of patients, or one in, one in four, one in five patients, develop symptoms in the follow-up period. That's a pretty high percentage. And they found that EMG abnormalities, symptoms of radiculopathy, and an MRI hypertensity are predictors of early progression. And about 10% of these patients developed symptoms within the first year uh, after being initially seen. This is another retrospective review of 45 patients with mild DCM with an MGO score, uh, MGOA score of greater than 15 with T2 signal uh, change within the cord. 18% of patients had surgery at five years, but if you follow these patients out to 10 years, more than 50% of these patients needed surgery, required surgery, and had surgery at that 10-year follow-up. And probably the most compelling, I think, data for, for my argument in my talk, and this is a recent paper uh, Michael Failings is the senior author on, and this is a retrospective review of patients with newly diagnosed DCM. They looked at clinical outcomes in MRI scans. They had 117 patients. 
And if you specifically look at the patients with mild DCM, so MJOA scores of greater than 15, 50% of these patients had neurologic decline over 30 month follow-up. So this is me and that's my neck and I have some mild symptoms. I'm not sure if I'm gonna be okay with saying, hey, you know, 50% of the time you're gonna have neurologic worsening over a two year period. And my argument would be then why wait? You know, get me off this train as fast as you can. So what about risk of acute spinal cord injury? Again, I, I'm, I'm a big believer of not, uh, you know, avoiding the scare tactic in these patients. I don't think we do prophylactic surgery to prevent spinal cord injuries, but, but there, are, there is some data to support that if you have significant cord compression, and these are just two papers published in 2013, one that suggested an AP spinal canal diameter of less than eight millimeters uh, or a torrid Pavlov ratio of less than 0.7, you may be at a higher risk of spinal cord injury after minor trauma. This is just kind of a, um, a follow-up to that by Zogo Gowala and Rob Whitmer kind of saying, these studies really don't provide enough data to justify prophylactic decompression surgery to prevent spinal cord injury in this, in this patient population. But I think it's just something to consider and something to think about. So what about the risks and outcomes of surgery? And Sam, uh, Sam mentioned this. You know, I, I think at least when I was a fellow probably 12 years ago now, we were kind of thinking, well, you operate on patients with cervical myelopathy to prevent disease progression, to prevent neurologic decline, right? But I think there's a fair amount of studies now that actually show that these people tend to get better as well. And this is probably the landmark study that Sam uh, referred to uh, by Mike Failings. Um, and, and they showed that even in patients with mild cervical myelopathy, these patients had a clinical improvement after surgery. So just to kind of summarize, I think asymptomatic spinal cord compression and mild DCM are very different. I think the risk of progression of mild DCM is variable and it's probably still unknown, but up to 50% of patients have a neurological decline over 30 months if you look at that paper recently uh, published by Dr. Failings. I think the benefits of surgery for mild DCM are likely small, meaning those patients probably are not gonna get much better because their symptoms are mild, but it does halt pro uh, disease progression. I think the benefits of surgery likely outweigh the risks. You know, why wait till things get worse? I think these patients need to be educated, counseled. You have to value them very closely and have individualistic conversations with all of them. And I'll just kind of end, if this was my neck and I had spinal cord compression and mild symptoms, I'd want surgery because I'm going to want to continue to live my very active life and ski and not worry about this getting worse. Thanks a lot again. Appreciate the opportunity to participate and uh, looking forward to the discussion.